Greetings and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations. I'm Andy Brown. A financial revolution is underway. Cryptocurrencies, once promoted by fringe libertarians and anarcho-capitalists, have gone mainstream. Mass Mutual, the staid and fastidious American life insurer, has bought $100 million worth of Bitcoin. Tesla cars can now be purchased with Bitcoin. Just last week, the crypto exchange Coinbase went public at a valuation higher than the owners of the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ combined. Meanwhile, China is about to launch a fully digital currency, part of a long-term strategic move to challenge the hegemony of the US dollar. Could the virtual renminbi knock the dollar off its pedestal? Is blockchain going to rewire the financial world and put banks and clearinghouses out of business? And in a world where a Japanese dog meme coin is now worth about $50 billion, has the idea of value lost all meaning? To discuss this and other questions, I have with me an incredible panel of experts. So let's jump right into the conversation. I'm joining you today from Bloomberg headquarters in New York, and I'd like to welcome our global new economy community. We also welcome our viewers tuning in on social media and via the Bloomberg terminal. There will be opportunities throughout this conversation for real-time input from you, our audience. I encourage you to submit questions in the text box in the bottom right of your screen, and I'll invite you to vote in live polling in the top right of your screen. If at any point you encounter technical difficulties, a simple refresh of your browser should help get things back on track. So now I'd like to introduce our first guest. Geeta Gopinath is the economic counselor and director of the research department at the International Monetary Fund. She's on leave of public service from Harvard University's economics department, where she is the John Zwanstra Professor of International Studies and of Economics. She's also a member of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum Advisory Board. It's great to have you uh, here with us today, Geeta. Hi, Andy. Really a pleasure to join you. So first question, central banks all over the world are losing their monopoly on currencies to private crypto networks like Bitcoin, like Ethereum. How worried should they be? So, Andy, firstly, I would uh, dispute that claim that they are losing their monopoly power. Uh, private money has lived alongside uh, public money, which is cash, for the longest possible time. Uh, the question is whether these new technologies, the new cryptocurrencies, can you know, change the chain, move us to a world where people move out of public money and move purely into uh, private money. And I don't believe that's the case at all. I mean, to be uh, a legitimate currency, you need to have stable value. You need to be the ease, you know. You need to be able to transact easily with it. Uh, there has to be a storage value for it, uh, and all of that comes from the backing of uh, the, the trust that you have in public institutions. Uh, and so, I would say that many of the cryptocurrencies out there don't even meet the definition of money. Uh, I mean, they are very speculative investment assets, uh, and that's fine. But again, I, I would not describe this at the, that we're anywhere near the point of uh, central banks losing their monopoly power or money. Questions um, coming in from our audience uh, for you. Uh, here's one from Daniel Antonucci. He is the chief economist and macro strategist for Quintet Private Bank in London. He asks, are private cryptocurrencies complements or substitutes of central bank digital currencies? Will the latter displace the former or is the reason to hold them entirely different? So, they, I mean, the answer depends on the design of central bank digital currencies. And we are still in very early days here. So we do have, you know, the Bahama sand dollar. We have uh, the Chinese uh, digital renminbi that's in pilot stage. Uh, and at this point, they are very restricted in how they can be used uh, in terms of what, what kinds of compensation they pay in, when you hold it. 
So whether these multiple currencies turn out to be substitutes or complements depend on the design. Now, what I will say is that given that most central banks in the world do not want to get into you know, banking activities uh, you know, and they have no desire to displace banking systems around the world, uh, I believe that wherever these heads will be one where there will be uh, significant uh, complementarity. Now, of course, there are the separate questions of certain kinds of cryptocurrencies, which again, are not exactly money, very speculative asset classes. Uh, there can be concern about, you know, those currencies being used for money laundering, for terrorism financing. And, and in that particular case, I, I suspect the regulatory apparatus will come in there to ensure that that doesn't happen. Central, as you say, central uh, central bank digital currencies all over the world are in various stages now of of development. We have a graphic. Um, I wonder if we could we could pull pull that up, uh, showing this this phenomenon. Gita, you you talked about the Bahamas and the sand dollar. You also mentioned the fact that the People's Bank of China is is moving full speed ahead with the digital currency, as supposed to be trialed at the Winter uh, Olympics uh, in 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 February. Um, the Chinese insist this is largely a domestic uh, effort to improve financial inclusion, to combat fraud and so on. Uh, but it's pretty clear that one of the uh, primary goals is to escape the hegemony of the US dollar. In other words, China wants an alternative to a dollar-based global order. Is the dollar, do you think, under threat? So indeed, in the case of, uh, in the case of China, you know, they have said that their focus right now is uh, for domestic use uh, and that whenever they do go into cross-border use, they will work with the international community to make sure that things go smoothly for the recipient country uh, also. So, you know, their plan is to be engaged with the international community on this whenever, that, whenever the cross-border use uh, happens. But to your question of whether uh, a Chinese renminbi which is now in digital form, can replace the dollar, I'm quite skeptical about that. Uh, because if you look at the dollar's dominance, it shows up in, you know, in payment systems, it shows up in, in trade invoicing, it shows up in international uh, finances, in borrowing and lending contracts. And so you actually have to be very strong in multiple institutions to be able to take over that role. What does that mean? That means that you need, uh, you know, strong rule of law, you need uh, trusted public institutions, you need uh, protection for investors, uh, you know, and you need deep financial markets, you need a fully convertible currency. So there are many boxes that you have to check. Uh, and I would say that China is still in early stages uh, on uh, several of those, uh, you know, infrastructure pieces that are still required to become uh, a dominant currency in the world. So as you say, Gita, one of those boxes to tick is, is in fact trading. And, and China right now, as you know, is working with several of its trading partners to set up a cross-border payment system based on a digital renminbi. Some of its partners are very keen to break free from the dollar system, like Iran. Do you think we could see a, 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 a Chinese renminbi trading block emerge? And if so, wouldn't that, by definition, be a threat to the dollar primacy? So again, I think that I think China has, uh, you know, has has made clear that they do intend to work with the international community to ensure that any kind of cross border use is not disruptive to the global economy and certainly doesn't support any kind of nefarious activities. Uh, and so again, you know, this will happen in stages, and so we can see how that uh, how that builds up. Uh, now let's uh, now I just want to say since I'm coming across as a bit negative, I think I should mention that, of course, there are benefits to having these kinds of digital currencies in the sense, especially for cross-border payments, because, you know, those are costly. So there is an, uh, uh, you know, there is a need for these kinds of technologies uh, for when you're, when you're, you know, remitting money to countries, other countries, you're paying too much in terms of fees. If you're a small exporter or importer, you're paying too much uh, for your transactions. And so again, there is a need for these kinds of currencies, but these are all niche areas. Uh, and again, uh, 
you know, it is the responsibility of the international community to ensure that the rules and regulations are put in place, that these currencies, you know, serve a purpose, they have benefits, but they certainly don't go into supporting the kinds of activities you do not want to have. Uh, and also, I would say individual countries have to be careful about currency substitution, which is that if it so happens that it's very easy to now move these digital currencies around, uh, then you would end up with a currency substitution, especially in countries where, for instance, inflation is extremely high. So, I, you know, countries have to be cautious. There are benefits to having these currencies, but there are certainly risks associated with it too. Well, Jerome Powell doesn't seem to be in much of a hurry to launch a digital dollar. His mantra apparently is that it's better to be right, to get it right, than to be first. Do you think that he may be a bit too complacent, including about the challenge coming from potentially from the renminbi? I mean, I'd say that what we've seen over the last year, and especially after this pandemic, is that the momentum is very much in the direction of, you know, digital payments, digital currencies. Uh, and I really don't see how any major central bank can, can, you know, distance itself from this. So I do expect that all central banks, including major central banks, will uh, have to seriously consider uh, central bank uh, digital currencies, and that includes uh, the US. Now, of course, again, I think the reason you want to move a bit cautiously is because you certainly don't want to upset the financial system. You don't want uh, central bank digital currencies to make private banking become very difficult. You don't want currency substitution to happen across borders. So there are clearly risks involved here. You don't want to have to worry about cybersecurity risks on a daily basis. So there are, of course, you know, many risks to be considered. But I just don't see how you can sit back. I mean, I think the momentum is all in one direction. Peter Thiel, uh, the co-founder of PayPal, made waves a few days ago. And he warned that Bitcoin could undermine the dollar's position as a global reserve currency. In that sense, he calls it a Chinese financial weapon. What do you make of that claim? Oh, I strongly disagree. I mean, I, I just don't see how that is the case. Uh, no, I mean, again, Bitcoin is an example of a cryptocurrency that doesn't serve the role of money at all. Uh, you know, it's a very speculative investment class, and then people are betting on the value going up all the time. You know, you're gambling, you're taking risks, and that's fine that you, you do this. But in terms of substituting for what money is, I, I don't think it comes close. So... The crypto craze has introduced a huge amount of volatility and quite a bit of uncertainty into financial markets. Is there a risk, do you think, Gita, that this could destabilize emerging market economies that are already under massive stress as a result of, of COVID? Um, last week, for instance, um, uh, Turkey banned Bitcoin trading amid pressure on the, on the lira. Um, is that, do you think, a, a symptom of a bigger problem or is it just something particular to a particular issue with, with Turkey? I, mean, I think given the much greater ease with which you can, you know, move money around in, this, in, in the digital form, uh, the e greater ease with which you can evade maybe certain rules that the country has put in place in terms of foreign currency use, I think should give countries certainly pause about, uh, you know, what kinds of cryptocurrency activity they allow. Uh, it, you know, things are moving very rapidly. Uh, the, the legal frameworks haven't yet been uh, developed to deal with these kinds of uh, uh, capital flows. So I can see why countries, especially developing countries, uh, emerging markets might be more cautious about the use of these kinds of cryptocurrencies, because you certainly don't want to have now a new form of money that's basically evading all the rules and regulations of your local, uh, you know, of your of your country, and uh, you know you want to you want to move cautiously on that front. So I can see why you would want to you know pause and make sure that uh, these these kinds of cryptocurrencies are not disruptive for your economy, for your conduct of monetary policy, uh, and so on. Last question, Gita, you mentioned the benefits of, of uh, frictionless 
cross-border payments that potentially crypto offers. The downside, of course, is that that too uh, could lead to greater volatility uh, and threaten emerging economies in particular. Indeed. I mean, that is uh, a risk that comes with uh, th this technology. Uh, you know, it has its benefits. It can ease cross-border payments. Uh, but on the other hand, it can also lead to much greater volatility as you know, you have less control and the amount of capital coming in and out of your economies, uh, the risks associated with it. I think there are even, you know, there are volatility risks associated even with your domestic financial system. Again, depending on the design of central bank digital currencies, you know, you could have a lot more quicker moving out of private money into public money that's happened then, that has happened in the past. Uh, so again, these design issues are going to be very, very important uh, in you know making sure that you know the world benefits from the technology, but uh, at the same time safeguards itself against the risks. Gita Gopinath, economic counselor and director of the research department at the IMF, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Okay, let's go now to our panel of experts. I'd like to welcome uh, Raj uh, Damodran. He is MasterCard's Executive Vice President for Digital Asset and Blockchain Products and Partnerships, responsible for managing global strategy in the blockchain and digital assets space. Welcome to the program, Raj. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Hester Puss is serving as a commissioner on the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Prior to joining the SEC, she conducted research on the regulation of financial markets at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and previously served as a senior counsel on the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs. Thanks for being here today, Hester. Thanks, Andy, for having me. Michael Sonnenschein is the Chief Executive Officer of Grayscale Investments, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Prior to joining Grayscale, Michael was a financial advisor at JP Morgan Securities. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Great to be here. Um, so, uh, we're getting, a, we're getting a, 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 as I mentioned, a lot of, of audience uh, questions. I'd like to encourage everyone in the audience to keep, to keep them uh, coming. We will use them. Uh, in fact, I want to kick off our conversation by putting an audience question to the panel. Uh, DeFi um, or uh, decentralized finance, the idea of eliminating financial independent, uh, intermediaries that really underpins block-based uh, finance. This question comes from uh, Abhu Adiga in India, who asks, will DeFi lead to disintermediation of banking as we know it today? Um, Raj, um, maybe you could address that question from the perspective of credit card companies. In China, as you know, digital payment systems have pretty much replaced credit and debit cards. What's to prevent that outcome elsewhere in the world? Look, we've been, uh, MasterCard for decades have been moving digital currency and helping, um, uh, you know, consumers, merchants and safely spend around the world, move the value. And a lot of it comes from making sure that the currencies are, first of all, stable to Keita's point, making sure that the currencies are the right currencies to, uh, for people to transact on. And, uh, uh, what we, take pride ourselves is providing a safe ecosystem for our customers to participate as well as to move value. Now, you know, I think that's continued to be needed in, in all of these environments, including DeFi. Um, for example, we have a FinTech Accelerate program where we partner with all of our uh, partners to bring them on board so that they can uh, take advantage of our network scale and safety and security. So the way that we look at these things is uh, uh, we provide consumer choice, merchants the choice uh, to be able to innovate on our platform. And I think that will continue to happen. Hester, from where you sit uh, as a regulator, are we looking, do you think, at an evolution uh, of the existing financial system? Are we in a transition to something fully digital? 
Um, or are we going to see a complete break with the past? Is the consumer and the financial industry prepared for this kind of shift? Well, I should start by saying that the views that I represent are my own views and not necessarily of the SEC or any other financial regulator. I do think that the, the financial system is in the process of a transition. Um, and I think that that is partly being driven by crypto and just and, and partly being driven by the realization that more of our lives are being lived digitally. And, and that is going to happen in the financial sector as well. And so I think um, we as regulators need to adjust our expectations. We tend to be pretty slow in, in adjusting our regulatory frameworks um, for the for the new economy. And so I think we better we better uh, get to work on that. Michael, um, another audience uh, question on DeFi. This one comes from Paul Miller. Um, who is the founder of Miller Capital Investments in Fort Collins, Colorado. He asks, some of the conventional wisdom is that large financial institutions will seek to slow DeFi. How might they adopt it, though, as a competitive advantage for themselves? Well, I think that the entire decentralized finance movement is still very, very, very new. Um, I would say, you know, from our perspective on the industry, it's something that's only really started to get meaningful traction over the last 12 to 18 months. And I think there are certainly opportunities for legacy financial institutions to either plug into the DeFi ecosystem um, or potentially figure out other ways to compete with it. But I think the most important thing for folks to ask themselves as an investor today is when they do look at protocols within DeFi, are they actually solutions that are actually solving real world problems that we're experiencing in the financial system? Or in some instances, are they just solutions in search of a problem that may not even exist? And I think a lot of investors are tasking themselves or should be tasking themselves with that question because it really can help to streamline you know, some of the areas where you may think about getting exposure in your portfolio. This, this idea of um, uh, decentralized finance, DeFi, is really appealing to a lot of, a lot of folks out there. Uh, uh, Nicholas Sherman, uh, the president of Williams Valve Corp in New York, asks, will DeFi gain mass retail adoption uh, in the next 10 years? R Raj, what do, you, what do you think? I have to go with Gary on this. I think it's really about solving consumer problems, so much uh, business problems. And I think we have to start there before we um, try to project out in the future, right? Um, I think uh, it's DeFi, most of the solutions right now are, are, are um, the activity that is happening with, is within the crypto world. I'd love to see a use case that applies to um, the everyday consumer or a merchant, and we are open to working with all of those people who are innovate uh, in this space. Uh, that's why we uh, we have a very friendly uh, fintech partnership program, and um, so that we can identify those use cases together. But it, I think it has to start with the consumer problem. Uh, we have to keep consumer safety and security in mind and compliance uh, in mind while we uh, while we continue to innovate. Hester, um, last Friday, the price of the internet meme token Dogecoin, literally a joke, a joke coin named after a Japanese dog breed, more than doubled and reached the market value. Uh, it's now at about $50 billion, up 400% from a week ago. Uh, we, we have a chart showing the total cryptocurrency uh, market cap has soared this year to, 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 two, to two trillion dollars. Look, th this is this is now becoming the wild, wild west of, of, of finance. Why has regulation taken so long to catch up? Well, as an initial matter, I'm not sure that, you know, that particular asset is one that we would have any regulatory authority over. Um, so that that may or may not fall within our purview but and and that's true of crypto more generally we have a we we have purview over things that are securities transactions and that's where we've focused our attention i mean there's been a lot of really rapid growth in this area so 
regulators tend to move slowly and the crypto markets do not. Um, and so we're always going to be playing a little game of catch up, which is why we really need to work on rules that are as technologically neutral as possible so that they can accommodate changes. Um, I, I will say that it's not surprising when something is new as I mean, crypto isn't new, but there's a lot of activity going on now. And I think that's that's what you expect. There's experimentation. There's going to be failure. There are going to be projects that look like they're, they're um, solutions in, in search of a problem. But it's from that that some projects will emerge and I think will have quite dramatic changes um, on the way the financial system works and also on the way that people interact with the financial system. Um, it, it will enable people to engage in more peer-to-peer -peer transactions. I think there's still going to be a lot of room for financial intermediaries. Um, but these, these kinds of transitions take time and, and there, there is a lot of um, fluff and failure at the beginning, but from that you get the true solutions. You, you made a speech uh, last month outlining the way you look at crypto regulation. Um, I, I would recommend everybody reads that speech. It's beautifully written, um, it's erudite, it's sympathetic, uh, it cites legal precedent, um, and it also quotes Bruce Springsteen. Um, how does the boss inspire your thinking about crypto regulation? Well, pretty much everything inspires me to think about securities regulation in general, so it can be music or, or many other things. But look, I think that the, the notion of, of allowing people to transact with one another in their medium of choice and allowing people to store value in their medium of choice and allowing this new layer on the internet to develop um, so that people can exchange value with one another across the world is a very powerful concept. Now, you probably shouldn't look to me, a regulator, to predict uh, you know, the future value of this to society. I think regulators are not known for being innovators, but but I think that there's there's really some exciting work being done here, and there is exciting potential for bringing more people into the financial system and enabling people to um, to participate with one another in a way that that benefits both people, both parties to the transaction. And we as regulators just need to figure out how to how how to protect the the things that we're charged with protecting, but also protect um, the freedom of people to, to engage in these kinds of transactions. So one of the big questions you're confronting uh, at the SEC is this, are crypto, are, are crypto networks commodities, essentially a speculative asset or a security uh, representing an investment, I guess, in a, in a venture? Um, two questions. First of all, how do you, how do you tell the difference? Um, and what are the implications of that categorization uh, for how the industry will develop? Well, it can be a difficult question, especially in the United States, where we have a pretty broad definition of security, and that's on purpose. We want to capture, of course, stocks and bonds, but we also capture a category called investment contracts, which is intentionally broad. It's to say, if you give me money so that I can build an enterprise and and you trust me to, to do the building and you're expecting profits based upon my work as a builder of that enterprise, then that thing that I sold to you is going to be considered to be a security. Now, this has been a, a, a framework that's worked fairly well over time, although even with non-crypto based things, it can sometimes be quite difficult to figure out whether something should be deemed to be a security or whether it's just another kind of asset. Um, and so it, the implication is that if something falls within the security category, if, we're, if we treat um, the transaction as a securities transaction, those transactions all have to abide by all of the rules in our securities markets, which can be quite, uh, it, can, it can add quite a bit of friction to a network. Um, and so it does matter. Um, by contrast, if something is a commodity, there's another regulatory structure and another regulator that that comes into play. And so these kinds of 
fundamental base questions. We, by not providing guidance around those kinds of things, we've, we've really slowed the development, I think, in this space and made it much more difficult for people to concentrate on the technology because they're spending too much time thinking about which regulatory box things fit in. A question for you before we, we turn to Michael. Um, you're obviously committed uh, to bringing crypto networks into the mainstream. Reading your speech, um, you clearly think that they're a creative, uh, progressive, innovative force that need to be encouraged. Not all government officials share your uh, enthusiasm. Janet Yellen, uh, Treasury Secretary, seems to think that Bitcoin creates more problems than it solves. She said a few weeks ago, Bitcoin is a highly speculative asset. She's worried about investor losses. She doesn't think Bitcoin is much use in facilitating transactions. She highlights Bitcoin's use in illicit finance. And finally, she notes that it is incredibly polluting. Is there any prospect you think that financial regulators aligned perhaps with skeptical politicians could come down really hard on this industry or even outlaw parts of it? Or, or, or is it too late? Well, I certainly think that there are answers to each of those critiques of crypto, but um, we probably don't have time to go through all of those right now. And yes, I think that regulators in some jurisdictions will try to curtail activity in this space, but because of its nature as a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technology, that's a very difficult thing to do. And I think it's far wiser for regulators to spend their time thinking about allowing, allowing crypto to interact with our traditional legacy financial system, which is something that I've been calling for, so that people can engage in crypto the same way they engage with other kinds of assets. And that's a much better way for regulators then to um, get to know the technology and to get to know this asset class and to have an eye on the asset class. So it seems to me that, that a better approach would be to acknowledge people's freedom to engage in the kinds of transactions they want to engage in to work on building the infrastructure so that that um, sector can marry up with the traditional legacy financial sector. Michael, you were saying earlier, it's important to analyze you know, the uses of cryptocurrencies. Um, what are they good for? Let me, let me ask that, that question to you um, on Bitcoin. Uh, beyond acting as a, a inflation hedge and alternative to gold, what problem does it solve? I think that for many investors looking at Bitcoin, they certainly today do look at it as that, you know, store of value or, you know, gold 2.0. But I think that it's also important to recognize that there's nothing wrong with the fact that at the moment, that is probably the most prevalent use case for Bitcoin. It is only something, you know, Commissioner Peirce talked about this concept of, of time and, and regulators having to play catch up or not moving as fast as we sometimes want them to. We have to remember that Bitcoin has only existed for the last 10 or 12 years or so. And so the, the use cases that can be unlocked out of Bitcoin and out of other digital currencies, many of them have not come to fruition. We look at things like financial inclusion. We look at things like micropayments, microfinancing, micro lending. Um, all kinds of dynamics um, around payments and financial infrastructure that unfortunately the existing uh, you know, legacy infrastructure just doesn't lend itself to. And so for many of us within the community, we don't take issue with the fact that Bitcoin you know, today has you know, very, very you know, accomplished, gotten to about 10% of the market cap of gold um, and is continuing to take even you know, further share of that market. But certainly over time, we would expect that additional use cases will be unlocked. Um, which of them comes first, obviously, remains to be seen. But that's why it's important we continue to remind ourselves of really just how early days it is for Bitcoin. So a lot of people are saying because large institutions like Mass Mutual, uh, Morgan Stanley are buying cryptocurrencies along with legendary investors like Paul Tudor Jones 
uh, that, that this proves that crypto has now entered the mainstream. And the implication is that because these huge savvy investors are buying Bitcoin, um, you know, uh, it's safe and so should you. Um, is that the case? I mean, is it is it right? Is it right for me? Is it right for my mother? We would be the first to say, um, as we always have been, that investing in crypto is not something that is for every investor. Um, certainly, there is a compelling argument to be made that investors who have longer term time horizons can stomach a fair bit of volatility um, and can afford to pretty much lose everything they put into this um, is certainly the right type of investor to think about cryptocurrency. It is something that many investors analogize to investing in an early stage technology, but it is, again, a nascent asset. And so you have dynamics in this market, which, while they are continuing to mature every day, is still a market that has, at times, tremendous volatility. Um, but every day that passes, we're seeing you know, the, the advent of additional avenues for investors to participate and certainly over the last you know, eight years that I've been involved in the industry, I've never seen crypto be at a point where it is now gaining the support, the adoption and the usage of not only legacy financial players, but also from some very notable, very storied investors, um, very you know, notable people coming out in support of it uh, on the regulatory front. And you know, we're you know, now even seeing adoption on, on companies' balance sheets uh, which is something that we've never experienced before, all of which definitely does lend some validity to the ecosystem and certainly can give investors greater comfort in crypto's you know, staying power in their portfolios. Question here for you, Michael, from uh, Saar Ben Atta, who's the managing partner at Ascent Growth Partners in Johannesburg. Saar asks, what moves by banks could help bring digital currencies into the international financial system? The biggest thing that banks can do, um, which they are doing, but it is happening slowly, is all about infrastructure. So today, the crypto ecosystem has very robust infrastructure in and of itself. We're developing trading tools, order management systems, tax lot reporting, um, forensic tools that can analyze transactions on the blockchain. Um, the list goes on and on. But the legacy financial system, the big banks, the global banks, have their own set of infrastructure and their own set of pipes that govern the way that assets move around, the way that value moves around. And while they're continuing to innovate, it is happening quite slowly. And I'd argue today that the innovation within the legacy system and the innovation that's taking place in the crypto ecosystem are certainly happening on very, very different timelines. But unfortunately, there has not been a major push yet to connect the legacy infrastructure with this new crypto ecosystem. And so over time, as we do see those bridges getting built, you're going to see the potential for a lot more capital to flow into the asset class and also open up the opportunity for a much, much, much broader group of investors to be able to participate in the crypto ecosystem. So let me ask you this. T today is April the 20th, uh, 420. Uh, and as such, and for incredibly arcane reasons, um, today is celebrated by certain millennials in this country as weed day, pot smoking day. In any case, the uh, Dogecoin tribe of, of, uh, of millennials have bid up the price, I think another 10% uh, today. What do you make of Dogecoin? Uh, I mean, is it, is it the equivalent of pet.com during the internet boom? So Dogecoin is not an area of the market that I personally or Grayscale has spent a lot of time on. I think what it importantly does highlight, though, is it creates um, you know, potentially problems for you know, the regulatory community as they look at the ways in which dynamics in the market have changed. You know, certainly during the pandemic, there's been a lot of people that have been at home, that have been turning to the financial markets, um, whether it's you know, purely for investment or in some cases for entertainment, we're now seeing the advent of really the power of social media really being able to move 
investments. And so whether that's Dogecoin or GameStop um, or other areas of the market, it certainly is going to and is already creating a challenge for regulators to, to look at those dynamics in the market and potentially how disruptive they may be. But certainly, you know, Dogecoin, I think, highlights yet another example of um, kind of the power of these social media networks um, and when a group of investors can rally around a particular investment opportunity. OK, but I, I mean, Bitcoin trading is a bit crazy, too, is it not? I mean, five days ago, it was trading at 64,000. Today, I think it's, it's gone down for five straight days. It's now around about 55,000 before COVID uh, um, you know, presented itself. I think it was trading at below four, below something like 4,000. 4, um, how, how, are, how are investors supposed to differentiate between Dogecoin and Bitcoin and the myriad other coins that are, that are out there? So there's a lot of tools available to investors that I think are new and sometimes difficult uh, to sometimes wrap their heads around. So unlike looking at a traditional stock where you might be able to do a discounted cash flow or you know, do some more traditional investment framework to determine whether it's a compelling buy or not, or whether something's overvalued or undervalued, there's actually quite a bit of analysis that's available by looking at the underlying blockchain. And so a lot of investors who look at Bitcoin um, are looking at, you know, for example, the time um, since coins have previously been moved, or is the asset as a whole being tighter held, or is it more of it moving over to exchanges where presumably uh, investors are, are looking to sell uh, their holdings? Um, and, and those types of analyses are not available necessarily with traditional stocks or bonds. And so I think one of our goals, certainly at Grayscale, is to develop those kinds of tools that investors can make informed investing decisions. But again, to, to the earlier point, I can't underscore enough, crypto does have a lot of volatility. And what we see is that each time um, there is you know, potentially a draft down in price like we've experienced recently, we do see a lot of leverage get pulled from the ecosystem um, and often see that the ecosystem does emerge even stronger on the other side of those types of moves. Finally, Michael, um, uh, your company, Grayscale, uh, it runs the, the world's biggest cryptocurrency trust. You've got more than $40 billion in assets. Now you want to transform yourself into an exchange traded fund, but you're waiting for SEC approval. When do you expect that to happen? Perhaps we should ask Hester that question too. So, um, yeah, so we are, our flagship product is the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. It's the world's largest Bitcoin vehicle, um, owns over three and a half percent of the outstanding Bitcoin supply. Um, I think from, from our seat, you know, to Hester's, uh, Commissioner Purse's earlier point, um, regulators are very engaged. Um, you know, she has actually put forward a proposal that actually allows would allow for tokens to come into the market and have a safe harbor for a number of years before they would experience any kind of regulatory scrutiny. And so I think from our standpoint, it's all about continuing to engage with the regulatory community, which we long have and, and long will continue to do. Um, and ultimately, we do believe a Bitcoin ETF will come to the market here in the US. It's really a matter of when, not so much a matter of if. And I think some of the things that regulators are looking for are to see an increasingly mature market and dynamics within the market that are surveillable and maybe are a little bit more akin to what they may see in traditional markets like you see for stocks and bonds. Raj, philosophically, peer-to-peer uh, -peer crypto networks were created as a libertarian alternative to financial institutions like credit card companies and commercial banks and monetary authorities. Yet MasterCard now actually facilitates cryptocurrency and uh, uh, base transactions. Fundamentally, what is the relationship between credit card companies and, and crypto networks? Um, do you compete or do you collaborate? Yeah, look, um, it is all about choice, right? So what we what we um, said um, in the past was, um, and recently was, that uh, we will select, we will support um, central bank digital currencies and some select digital currencies, private digital currencies in our network. That's what we said. 
And that if you look at what that is about, like I said before, we've always been facilitating moment of value uh, between consumers, businesses, peer-to-peer, -peer, and so on for a number of decades. So this just builds on that. Um, if uh, the currency follows a certain principles that we laid out, which is really about stability, number one is stability, number of uh, people here talked about it, it need to be a credible payment vehicle and allow uh, the stable value to be there for people to use it as a, as a payment vehicle. That's number one. The second is really about compliance and making sure that the currency and the, uh, what we are talking about in a given jurisdiction is a valid medium of exchange in that, uh, for that purpose. And the last one, and it's very important as well, is the consumer protections. And the consumer protections is about providing safety and security as people transact. When you go and send money to someone, you need to know who the other party is. If you go spend at a merchant, they need to know what that merchant is. So that kind of level of protection, as well as the privacy of the protection, is what our network is built on. So we simply look at those principles and see, you know, which currencies that would fit into uh, into that that mode, and then we'll be very thoughtful in picking the right markets and the right currencies um, for that. So that's how we look at it, and we look at it as a, a collaboration and a partnership. It is about the choice. If consumer wants to use a certain currency for a payment for goods and services, we'll facilitate that within those principles that we've laid out. So that's how we approach this problem. So right now, if I'm hearing you correctly, MasterCard is acting as a kind of a bridge um uh, or an interface uh between legacy fiat currencies like the dollar and the new class of digital uh, token currencies is this a transitional arrangement do you think um or do you think these two financial architectures old and and new will sort of permanently coexist like we always had evolution of technology in many of these places. There are multiple networks that we help run. Card network is the most visible one. We help run ACH networks in many parts of the world. And, you know, so running, working um, with partners around the world to run different types of networks to facilitate moment of value is not new to us. So I'll give you an example. You know, somebody talked about Sand Dollar, which is in Bahamas today, um, that was launched as, as a pilot program. So we worked with Island Pay, which is one of the partners there, to launch a card as uh, associated with the CBDC. So uh, as central banks look to launch uh, uh, digital currencies around the world, uh, whatever their motivations or objectives are can't be met if the currency is not used. We have one of the largest acceptance networks in the world. And by providing a card product to sit on top of the central bank digital currency, we are providing everyday utility with the safety and security that comes with it. So, so to answer your question, there is, there is bridging that is needed and we are prepared to look at core use cases as well that is totally blockchain based in fact we have solutions out there that are purely blockchain based that is commercial in our um in our world so we are open to um the evolution on it and we partner with the industry to make it happen you haven't mentioned bitcoin as one of the select uh cryptocurrencies that mastercard will support uh, what would it take for MasterCard to begin supporting uh, Bitcoin and are there any plans to do so? Look, what we said is, I think this has been talked about quite a bit here today, uh, is about the stability, whether it is a very um, good payment vehicle for people to use. Um, right now, we look at that and we haven't publicly said what currencies we support and what currencies we want, but we look at its stability, we look at its compliance and, and safety and security. Um, today, it doesn't fit the stability side. And we, you just talked about the volatility of Bitcoin just now. Uh, I just don't see that as a payment vehicle. Um, what we see it as is, I think, as others, Michael and others talked about, it is an investment asset. And, and uh, it, it's not a payment vehicle at the moment. Uh, th this is from Fernando Quintana, uh, who is a business development business developer in Montevideo, Uruguay. Um, Fernando asks, what does MasterCard have to lose, if anything, uh, with the adoption of cryptocurrency payments to your systems? 
leaving aside inherent costs of putting everything into motion? Look, we um, we are about providing choice. Uh, we don't pick winners on which currency should work, which currencies that people should pay, pay with. We are about facilitating um, anything that people want to use to pay and get paid. But we also have a responsibility to the ecosystem to provide a safe and secure environment for people to transact on. Uh, people come to expect that if you go spend at a merchant and if merchant doesn't deliver the goods or services, you can actually call your bank and get your money back. Um, that kind of protection uh, is there end to end. That's what we look to provide. Um, so we're not here to pick you know, whether this currency should win, that currency should win. It's about really choice. It is about where consumer use cases are, business use cases are, and and we want to do that in a safe and secure manner. Okay, um, one more one more question, Raj, and then we're going to go to a to a an audience poll. Um, this one is from Mastercard's own uh, Heber Shams, who's the VP of Global Public Policy in Washington. Heber ask what is the impact of digital currency on the position or the dominance of the dollar globally? Um, I think people asked, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to go into the economic angles of this, but I think uh, multiple there are multiple motivations of digital currencies for um, various governments um, coming out. Uh, one is, uh, for example, Sweden publicly said the displacement of um, cash in the ecosystem, they're looking to find a digital equivalent of it. There are people looking at it from a financial inclusion perspective in terms of aid distribution. Um, uh, people are looking at it from a potential alternative to private digital currencies. So whatever the motivations are, end of the day, this is about really providing everyday utility. And we think uh, we have a great role to play and we continue to partner with the central banks to do this. In fact, we. Um, we have a virtual test platform that we've been public about that uh, central banks are looking at. It allows them to experiment the various forms of digital currency and how they can uh, configure it in a way that works with the industry, how they can make it work with ex everyday uh, use cases and so forth. So we take a very partnership centric approach on this. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the poll in just, in just one second. We're getting a lot of questions coming in about risk and safety. Uh, this one from Grant Whittle, the risk director at the BDO in Ireland, asks, how far should crypto sellers track post-sale for dark web usage? And what do you do when this is the case? H Hester, do you, do you want to talk about, uh, can you answer this question about the dark web? Sure. I mean, I think it's it's the same as with cash, that the same rules apply as with cash. And so trying to um, treat crypto differently, I think, is where we get into problems. You can't you can't try to track who, you know, if it's a centralized entity, which is subject to AML KYC, it is responsible for knowing its customer, but it's not responsible for knowing the counterparties of its customer. And so you know, in many ways, um, crypto allows for easier tracking by government authorities than does cash, for example. And so I think some of the focus on the use for illicit purposes really is over, is it, it's, it's overblown in this area. Um, there are ways to track this stuff. Yeah, Andy, I would just add to that. Um, you know, Commissioner Purse is 100% right. There are now several companies um, that have blockchain forensic tools where you can track transactions. And so people have very much over indexed using crypto for illicit activity. Every transaction leaves a proverbial kind of digital breadcrumb, if you will. And as a result of that, it is far more traceable than cash. And it's probably the worst means out there for doing anything the least bit nefarious. Okay, let's get to an let's get to an audience poll. Um, if we can bring this up, what will Bitcoin's price be one year from now? Wow, <laughs> four hundred thousand. Some chartists, believe it or not, think that's where we're headed. Sixty thousand, which is where it was a couple of days ago. 
zero, which is where R R Nouriel Roubini uh, thinks it might go, uh, it won't exist. Uh, those are your those are your options. And um, uh, while while our audience uh, contemplates the uh, the future of uh, uh, of Bitcoin price, Michael, um, would you hazard a guess? You said, "Wow, you don't think four hundred thousand." I was just saying, wow, at, at the options available here, um, you know, we're never ones to speculate on the price of Bitcoin, um, where it will be, where it won't be. Um, but what I certainly can share from my perspective and, and kind of purview in the industry, um, again, is really who's getting involved in the ecosystem, um, both from an investment standpoint, a human capital standpoint, infrastructure that's being built. Um, I've never been in crypto at a time that has felt um, this exciting um, or has really demonstrated um, what I think is the staying power that it now has. Well, look, this is pretty interesting. One, one third of, of our audience uh, think it's going to hit 400,000 um, uh, bucks, 57%, uh, 60,000. 60, does that, does that surprise Hester, does that surprise you? I think that Michael earlier in the conversation highlighted the fact that you have to you know, you have to be willing to risk your money when you invest it and make decisions about what level of risk you're willing to take. And so, whatever you're investing in, whether it's crypto or it's equities um, or it's commodities, you need to do your homework. You need to figure out what you're comfortable with, and you need to make sure you understand or you've hired someone. To help you understand what you're investing in and so i i just think getting caught up in what the numbers might be next year um i mean it's an interesting poll but it, that's not really my focus at all coinbase ceo brian armstrong said his company's listing marks quote a shift in legitimacy for crypto raj do you agree with that yeah, so Coinbase has um, brought um, a, a simple everyday access to uh, for people to buy, hold, sell crypto and transact. Um, so they are a huge part of uh, making that happen. So kudos to them. Uh, we also see the sector maturing quite well. So the number of players out there offering uh, products, um, uh, wallet products for consumers to buy um, and hold. And uh, we uh, we happen to work with a number of uh, number of them, including Uphold and uh, in US and 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 a few others around the world. Uh, yeah, it's in a very uh, important emerging sector, and you may have seen some of them are also uh, getting into basically banking licenses um, to start to offer this service to. Uh, to consumers as a, as a bank as well, so uh, I think this is a this is a big deal, um, and it offers a level of um, access to consumers. We we are getting a lot of questions in about pollution, Hester. I know you you sounded a little skeptical about some of the critique uh, that Janet Yellen offered on Bitcoin. Um, I was reading a study recently that said. Uh, during peak Bitcoin, um, uh, the mining of these coins is going to equal roughly the electricity consumption of Italy. Um, it's going to be something like 5% of all China's carbon emissions, 75% of all Bitcoin apparently is mined in China. What, what are we missing? What are we missing here? What's, what's, the, what's the counter argument if there is one? Well, I mean, I think one counter argument is that we can all pick things that other people do that we don't think that they should spend their time, money, energy uh, doing. Um, but a second thing is that the, the mining can easily move to places where there's there's redundant energy being and energy that would otherwise be wasted being produced. But I think the real key is that, you know, I can say to you, hey, don't use a dryer, hang your stuff on the clothesline and think about how much energy everyone would save if we did that. We all make choices about how we spend our time and, and money and energy. And I think we'd be better off focusing on how can we transition to um, energy production that, that, that generates less carbon. And so we're all working on that together. But again, we, we that's really, a little outside my purview as a securities regulator. 
thank you anyway. A uh, uh, lot of questions also about uh, privacy, and we're, and we're almost out of time. So I'm I'm, I'm going to ask the a, a, a privacy question. I hope summing up what people are, are, are putting in here. Do you think that privacy issues could make central bank currencies unattractive? Could this be, for instance, a real obstacle to global adoption of the RNB? I mean, who wants the Chinese government in their wallets? What what do, what 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 do you think, Raj? This around the privacy issue. Yeah, privacy is a very important factor in, in, in the design of central bank digital currencies. And it is always a, um, is a balance between, you know, how much privacy you want to design in the system versus how much uh, visibility you need to make sure that the right set of activities, no illicit activities happen in the system. So it's a balance that need to be designed um, carefully. Uh, look, if you look at the digital currency today, digital money today, which is the bank accounts and the transactions happen in the bank account, people have privacy, but government is able to uh, investigate or look at uh, for illicit activity. Um, so there is a balance there in, in the banking system today. So we just need to look at this factor carefully. It is one of the things that our uh, virtual test platform allows people to do, to design those features and test it out to pick the right level of privacy that you should have in your design of uh, central bank digital currency. Uh, each government has to make a, uh, a decision on this, um, but there is a lot of factors to consider. This has been a fascinating conversation. We could go on, I'm sure, for another hour, uh, but I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we run out of time. Uh, Raj uh, Damodran, Hester Purse, and Michael Sonnenschein, thank you again for joining us today. We're grateful for your participation, for your perspectives. Special thanks to Geeta Gopinath for joining us at the top of the show as our fire starter. And to our audience, both within and beyond the Bloomberg New Economy community, thanks for joining us. You can follow the conversation with at New Econ Forum on Twitter or like us on Facebook. Until then, stay well. Thank you.